everyone. It is Erica and JC. We are here at the Emerald Coast Science Center inside of our planetarium. So sorry for the noise. We have our fan going, which is what blows air into the planetarium. So now, um, and my voice is being recorded on a microphone, so hopefully you guys can hear me okay. I hope you can. But we are going to do a tour of the night sky, and we are going to talk about Native American star shows. So this is our show where we talk about different Native American, American Indian myths and legends from around the United States. And the first half of our show, we're going to talk about the Milky Way and then a couple planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and then the sun and the moon. And the second half of our show, I'm actually going to change the sky around and show you some constellations from three different American Indian tribes. So we are going to have a fun planetarium, and hopefully you'll learn a lot from this. So first off, I want to talk about how there are over 500 American Indian tribes throughout North America, and each tribe has its own unique history and culture. For this show, we're not able to cover all 500 tribes, but I'm going to try to focus on some of the larger tribes, such as the Navajo, the Ojibwe, and the Lakota. And then I'm going to talk about stories from local tribes, such as the Choctaw and the Creek, who later became the Seminole Indians. So all these stories were passed on through oral tradition. So this means that they were um, spread from person to person by speaking the story. So there are always differences between different versions. Um, it's like a big game of telephone, so as time passes, the story changes and alters. So you might have heard different versions of these stories, but I'll keep it as true to the source material as I can. So one thing that I want to point out before we start is that most of these tribes in North America, uh, they held the four cardinal directions as being very, very sacred. So our North, East, South, West, these tribes base their architecture or their city layout on these four cardinal directions. And the nomadic tribes, the tribes that moved around, they also held these cardinal directions as sacred. So that is something that links a lot of these tribes together, is their, their value and their um, necessity for the four cardinal directions. And the nomadic tribes, they would be following herds across the Great Plains, so these directions were very important to them. Another common trend amongst American Indian tribes is that the historical record, it doesn't show a lot of interest in tracking time. Uh, so there's very, very few references to clocks or calendars in a lot of these tribes. And often time was told in a very simplistic, natural way. So the motion of the tides or what the sun's position in the sky was, what moon phase it was, or what season. So this is the, an example would be, this is the season when the bear hibernates, or this is when the strawberries ripen. So things were a much more simple, natural way of telling time. And a lot of these tribes tended to focus on the present more so than the future. And this is very different if you think about other cultures that were in uh, Central America, such as the Aztec or the Mayans. So they would, they were known for their very, very detailed and very accurate calendar predictions. So that's kind of something interesting to think about is that North America, the calendar wasn't the same as it was in Central America, so pretty interesting. And then if you have anything you'd like to add or any stories you'd like to hear in the future, just comment and we'll try to do that for you. So enjoy the show. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take our trees away and I'm going to make the sun disappear so we can see the stars a little bit better. So over the top of the sky, you will notice kind of a white hazy ribbon, a hazy white rainbow. And this is our Milky Way. So the Milky Way is our galaxy. It is where our solar system lives. So the Milky Way is actually a big spiral that's huge, gigantic. And our solar system lies in one arm of that spiral. That means there's lots of other solar systems, lots of other planets and stars. Um, but we are just going to focus on our solar system today. So the first story that I have, um, it comes from the... Creek and the Seminole Indian tribes. So this was a tribe that lived in the southeastern United States. So our area in, down here in Panhandle, Florida, and a lot of tribes believe that the Milky Way was kind of a magical pathway across the sky. So the Creek and Seminole, their story is about a creator god named Breathmaker. So his native name was Hisagita Misa, 
and he created the Milky Way as his home, and that it was considered to be an afterlife in traditional seminal cosmology. And so a lot of them thought of this as their version of heaven. This was kind of the, the pathway to get to heaven. So, long ago, the breath maker blew his breath towards the sky and created the Milky Way. This glittering pathway led to the city in the sky where the souls of good, brave, honorable people go when they die. The souls of bad people, those who lie and steal and speak evil, they stay in the ground where they are buried. It was believed that the Milky Way shines brightest following the death of one of the honorable people from the tribe. They believe that this is shining so brightly so that the person can see the path to the city in the sky and that they can travel there easily into the afterlife, into heaven. The Big Dipper served as their boat and it was used to carry the souls of the good people along the Milky Way and to the city in the sky. In the Seminole language, solo pi ine means spirit way or Milky Way for human souls. There is another Milky Way that they believe in and it is a path called ifi ine, which means the dog's way. And this is the sky path for the souls of dogs and other animals. Children were told not to be afraid of the dark because the Milky Way was Father Sky's arms around them protecting them. So that's a really nice story and it kind of shows us that there's a path to the afterlife for both people and for animals. So it's something very comforting to think about. All right, I'm gonna put up the planets. So these are the planet names that we know them by. This is the names that the Greeks and the Romans gave to them thousands of years ago. And we are actually going to go to the first planet closest to the sun. So the, a lot of these Native American tribes, um, they have stories about planets that are close to us, like Milky Way and Venus. Um, but further planets, they didn't have the technology like telescopes or anything like that, so they couldn't see them. So a lot of these stories have to do with these planets that are close. So we're going to start with, Mil with Mercury, which is our closest planet to the sun. I'm going to try to get you guys a better picture of him because he is covered in shadow. That shadow is actually being cast by us, by the Earth, because um, Mercury has phases just like the moon. So we cast the shadow because it's between us and the sun. So this is Mercury. Mercury is very unique. He moves very, very fast around the sun, and his days, are all, or his years, are only 88 days long. So he has very, very short years because he moves so quickly around the sun. So our story about Mercury So some tribes, such as the Chippewa and the Ojibwe and the Skitty Pawnee, they recognize that planets move around the sky in the shape of an, of an ellipse. And this is accurate. Planets did move around the sun in the shape of an ellipse, which is like a circle with squished inside. Uh, and also, moons revolve around planets in that same shape. So this is a very important shape. So these tribes noticed this, and they called this the Wolf's Trail. The planets were the wolves that prowled restlessly around the sun. So the Chippewa and Ojibwe, which come from the northern U.S. and Canada, they noticed the reoccurring pattern of Mercury and Venus together near the horizon in the morning and the evening. This led to a story about how Venus was so bright that she must be the sister of the sun. And Mercury was dimmer than Venus because he was the brother of the Earth. Their paths only occasionally crossed. And when they did, Mercury and Venus would shoot arrows at each other as a part of a contest. This story explained the meteor showers that would occur when the planets would cross paths. So pretty cool. All right, we're going to say goodbye to Venus, or to Mercury, and we're going to head over to Venus. So Venus is very special because she is the brightest object in our night sky beaten only by the moon. So the moon's super bright and Venus comes in second place. She was thought to be two different stars by a lot of different cultures, by the Greeks, the Romans. Um, she was thought to be two different stars because you can see her in the daytime and the evening. So she's known as the day star and the evening star. So eventually we figured out that she was a planet and she was the same object, but this is a little story uh, that talks about how Venus went from being two separate stars, the morning star and the evening star, to one bright star, which we now know as a planet. 
So this is from the Skitty Band of the Pawnee Tribe, who are from the Great Plains. And they were some of the most advanced star watchers in North America. They originally lived in Nebraska, but eventually moved to reservations in Oklahoma. So the Pawnee Tribe and the Skitty Band, so they have this story. In the beginning, there was only Tirwahat, which is the universe and everything in it. The morning star and the sun were powerful male gods. They and the other male gods in the sky were in favor of creating the world. However, the evening star and the moon were female goddesses. They convinced the other female goddesses in the sky to oppose the creation of the world, to not make it. So there was a big debate and to win this debate, Morningstar knew that he would have to win the heart of Eveningstar, and then she would vote as he voted. The problem was that Eveningstar had many protectors, the constellations of the wolf, the cougar, the bear, the bobcat, and the snake. Many gods had tried and failed to win her heart, and they had fallen to her protectors. Morningstar was unafraid, and one by one, he blinded the protectors with his luminous brightness he shone so bright and he defeated them winning the hands of the evening star then they became one and thus the males had enough votes and our world was created so that story tells about how venus went from being two different stars to one star to a planet so pretty cool all right our next destination you might be familiar with this is earth so there are lots and lots of Earth stories, and the one I'm going to tell you guys is a creation myth. So we can't see Earth right now from the planetarium because we're currently sitting on it, but we are going to get into our rocket ship, and we are going to launch off of Earth and into space. Let's go. So there we are. You can see Earth. You can see Florida really, really well. You can see that we are very blue. We're a very, very blue planet because of all that water. And we're very green as well. And this is how we can survive, all of that blue and green on there. So this story is from the Navajo tribe. The Navajo are one of the most successful tribes in regards to resisting this European culture. And they were able to preserve much of their own culture over time. The Navajo believe that the sky is the father and the mother is our earth. Everything on earth is sacred and nature strives to live in harmony. So it's the responsibility of all people to preserve and cherish that harmony and keep the earth safe and healthy. So we need to make sure that we're taking care of our mother earth and keeping her healthy. And we can do this by recycling and planting trees. Uh, and as much as it stinks how we have to quarantine right now because of what's going on, we're actually helping the earth to heal because we're not driving as much, we're not flying on airplanes, um, so a lot of stuff is happening. A lot more turtles are being born because we're not at the beach. Um, so we're, we're taking really good care of planet Earth right now. So that's a good thing. So this story is a Navajo myth about the origins of how Earth was created. Long ago, the Navajo emerged from the underground world known as Black World. First man lived in the east and first woman lived in the west. Though they were on opposite sides of the world, they both found the world barren. There were no plants, no mountains, no animals, no sky. The only life to be found were black insects, ants, wasps, and bees. They wandered the empty land alone. The first man burned a crystal, which symbolized the awakening of the mind. And the first woman burned a piece of turquoise, which symbolized unity. They saw each other's lights in the distance, and they found one another. They lived together in Black World, happy to have companionship and a friend. Then chaos came to Black World. So first man and first woman and some black insects migrated to the Blue World. Here they found a beautiful blue sky and many creatures such as blue birds, mountain lions, and wolves. Here they also met Coyote the trickster. But the animals of Blue World were at war with each other and first man saw this and wanted to help. He found a black stone called Jet and made a wand. He made three more wands of turquoise, abalone, and shell, and Coyote helped him. The animals climbed up into the blue sky on these wands, finding an opening in the hazy sky. 
This opening led them to the third world, yellow world. When first man, first woman, coyote, the animals and the insects all came to yellow world, they saw how large it was. They saw great mountains and they met other animals like deer and squirrels, turkeys, and great creatures of the water. They were very happy in yellow world until one day coyote took water monster's baby. Water monster was very angry and he decided to make it rain. It rained and rained and rained and the water rose higher and higher. Yellow world began to flood. First man, first woman, and all the creatures tried to escape the flood, but they had nowhere to go. First man planted a cedar tree, but it did not grow higher than the water. He planted a pine tree, but it was still too short. First woman gave him a reed, and he planted this reed, and it grew up into the sky. The beings climbed up the reed and found the fourth world, the white glittering world. The white glittering world is where first man and first woman settled down and built a home called a hogan. This hogan became the center of all Navajo life. It is the place where all ceremonies and important functions are carried out. All of the animals, insects, and water creatures were very happy in this world, and Coyote was very happy, and he promised to cause no more mischief. In this world, first man and first woman found an abandoned baby, and they named her Changing Woman. They adopted her, and she created more people who flourished in the white, glittering world that we live in to this very day. So pretty cool. So this story is very significant because it tells a flood myth. So a flood myth is something that is very, very common in different cultures and different mythologies from around the world. So in ancient Greece, we had a flood myth that had to do with uh, Pandora, and she opened her box and caused a flood. Uh, and even we have our flood myth in Christianity about Noah and his ark. So a lot of different cultures from Mesopotamia to Egypt, a lot of cultures from all over the world have a story of a flood. So a lot of historians and, and scholars believe that a flood may have actually happened. And these are the memories that have been passed down from all over the world are the stories of this flood. So pretty cool. All right, our next destination is the sun. Let's go over to the sun. The sun is super duper important. It gives us light. It gives us heat, energy, and it gives us a brightness. So it gives us light, heat, and energy to all of our, our plants and our animals. And we need it to survive because if we didn't have the sun, we would not last very long. So the sun is the center of survival in many stories and rituals are focused on this. One of the most famous uh, rituals that has to do with the sun is the Sundance of the Lakota Sioux Plains Indians. And the Sundance, it was a, they viewed, the Lakota viewed the sun as a superior divinity whose name was We, and he guarded the great mystery, which was Wakan Tonka. The Sundance is a ceremony of fasting and sacrifice that leads to the renewal of the individual and the group as a whole. It was not a ritual for sun worship, but instead it was a way of taking pain away from the universe or the damage away from nature. A young man who served as the practitioner or the dancer, he would suffer so that nature did not have to suffer. The Sundance is an annual supreme rite of sacrifice to the whole society, and these young men were able to demonstrate their bravery and their fortitude by participating in it and being dancers. So I'm not gonna go into details on this because I do have some kids out there listening, but I encourage you guys to, all the adults out there, to look it up on your own. The sun dances are really interesting um, ritual, ceremonial ritual, so definitely look it up. I will say that it is uh, an honor to be chosen as a sun dancer by your tribal band and that modern sun dances are still happening. So they were held at a sacred Lakota Sioux site of Devil's Tower in Wyoming, which is a national heritage site. Um, since 1983, these uh, modern dances have been held. So the ceremony is still being carried out to this day. So it's pretty important. So the story I wanna tell you, uh, there's a couple. The first is the Navajo, they had a sun god whose name was Soha no Ai and he was the most important deity in Navajo tradition. He was depicted as a warrior on the back of a blue horse because the blue horse represented the sky. He carries the sun as his gleaming shield, and at nightfall, when his journey is completed, he joins his wife, the goddess of the seasons, in their home in the west, which is where the sun sets. 
the Choctaw Indians of the southeastern United States, they placed the sun at the center of their cosmological system. In the 1700s, the Choctaw viewed the sun as a cosmic being gifted with life. And because of this, their diplomats and their elders would only speak on sunny days. If the day of a tribal conference or an important meeting was cloudy or rainy, the Choctaws would delay the meeting, usually saying they needed more time to talk about things, but in reality, they were waiting for the sun to return because the sun guaranteed that all talks would be honest. So the sun is viewed as a symbol of great power and reverence, and fire was the most striking representation of the sun, and it was thought to be in constant communication of the sun. So think about that the next time you see a fire, or you are making s'mores, is that the fire, is it talking to the sun? Because sometimes it's believed that it could be a representation of the sun on Earth, so pretty cool. Often the sun and the moon were seen as siblings, or they were seen as two entities that were in love. I have one more sun story, which is a little tale that comes from the Madu tribe of California. So father, sun, and mother moon lived inside the huge hollow rocks of Rock House. Because they were under the rocks, their light did not shine from the sky, and the people and animals lived in darkness. Now Coyote, who said that he would stop playing tricks, but we can't believe that for a second because it's Coyote, he was always playing tricks. And he thought it'd be really, really funny to dump some fleas on Father, Son, and Mother Moon. So he began to gather fleas and place them in bags. On his way to Rock House, he met Rabbit. When Coyote bragged about his bag of fleas, Rabbit didn't believe him. They began to argue and fight over one of the bags, tugging it back and forth. As Rabbit yanked it from Coyote's grasp, the bag opened and the fleas spilled out onto the ground. And this is why, to this day, Rabbit and Coyote are always scratching at fleas. Now, Rabbit liked Coyote's idea of taking the fleas to Rock House, so he decided to help. As they walked, they tried to think of a plan to get the fleas inside of Rock House. Along the path, they found Gopher digging a hole. They decided to include Gopher in on their trip. Gopher could dig a hole through the soil to Rock House. When they reached the top of the peak, Gopher began to dig quietly, so Father, Son, and Mother Moon would not be alarmed. As soon as Gopher backed out of the hole, Coyote and Rabbit shook the bag of fleas down the opening. Then they plugged up the hole and ran away, feeling very pleased with themselves. The fleas soon covered Father, Son, and Mother Moon. When Mother Moon could no longer stand the fleas, she flew out of Rock House and circled the earth. Father, Son followed Mother Moon out of Rock House. They raced around the sky trying to get rid of those fleas. That is why to this day, the sun and the moon are in the sky constantly moving around trying to get rid of those fleas. All right, our next stop is the moon. I am gonna move the sky just a little, oh wait, there it is, found it. All right. So here we are, the moon is a new moon right now, so we are actually going to jump ahead in time a little bit so you can see the moon a little bit better. So just as the sun was a prominent fixture in Native American myths, so was the moon. Being the brightest object of the night sky, many legends were created to explain this mysterious and ever-changing appearance of the moon. There's also archaeological evidence that proves that American Indians have been tracking and naming the lunar cycles for centuries. So let's look at some of those real quick. So we have our full moon, and then as we go across, you guys can see the different phases. So we get to the crescent, then the new moon, and then we go back. So the American Indians had different names for the lunar cycles. Uh, and for example, they were often what was happening at the time, like the ripening of berries or the coming of caribou. The first signs of sky watching can be found on artifacts such as rocks and bones that have scratches on them which correspond to the lunar cycles. So here is a story that explains why the moon changes shape. This story is from the Winnebago tribe in Nebraska and it has a very, very clever explanation for the moon's phases. And while we listen to it, let's go land on the moon. 
In the time of beginnings, the good spirits and the evil spirits met in council to determine how the world would be divided between them. First, they took up the question of how many moons there should be from one winter to the next. Wild Turkey strutted before them, spreading his tail feathers and declaring, let a year be as many moons as there are spots on my tails. But the Council of Spirits voted this down, as there were far too many spots on his tail. Partridge also suggested that there should be many moons in a year as there are spots on his tail, but the spirits felt that this was also too long a time. Then Chipmunk scampered up, throwing his tail over his head as chipmunks always do, and said, let a year be as many moons as there are black and white stripes down my back. The counselors thought well of this suggestion and allowed the six black stripes to be the summer moons and the six white stripes to be the moons of winter. But the evil spirits are greedy and they always wish for darkness. So when they saw this bright white disc of the moon and how it lit up the world, they began to gnaw and eat at the moon until there was nothing left of it. But the earth maker, he was not content to see his creation consumed. He did not want to leave the world in darkness as a cover for evil. So he recreated the moon a little bit each night until the end of 14 nights, it was once again full. Then the earth maker rested. While he rested, the evil spirits once again came out and gnawed at the moon until it was completely consumed. And so it continues. The evil spirits are forever eating the moon away, and the earth maker forever recreates it to save us from having to live in darkness. All right. So that is our story of the moon. So what I am going to do now is I am going to show you our constellations. I'm going to take away those planets. So these are the constellations that we are familiar with. These are our Western constellations. Um, these are the ones that we learn in school. And these were named by the Greeks and the Romans. So these constellations, there are 88 of them. And the Northern Hemisphere, the Northern Hemisphere are named by the Greeks. And a lot of these names come from our heroes like Hercules and Perseus and our monsters like Hydra um, or the uh, what other good ones, Scorpius. We have Draco the dragon. So we have monsters, heroes, and then uh, we also have the 12 signs of the zodiac. So you guys can see some of those, Libra, Virgo, Leo, Cancer. So these constellations were discovered about 2,000 years ago and named, and then the Southern Hemisphere, these constellations were discovered about 400 years ago in the 1600s by Italians. So the Italians used their, their telescopes and they were able to come up with new constellations and discover them. So they named them after modern inventions of the time. So an example of this is there's Camilla Pardalis over there. So that's named after, it was thought to be a mythical creature that was a cross between a camel and a leopard that they heard stories about from Africa. And this magical camel leopard animal ended up being a giraffe, which we know as not magical, but as very real. But they didn't know that back then. They just thought it was a crazy animal. And then we have some more modern ones like a telescopium, microscopium, fornax the furnace, all different constellations named after modern inventions from the 1600s. So these are the constellations we know and love. I am going to take these away, and I am going to put up the constellations for the Navajo tribe. So I'm going to show you three different tribes and what their stars look like. Oops. Oh.
So here are the Navajo constellations. I'm going to make this rotate and just for fun, I love to add some pictures. So, long ago, the Creator called all animals on Earth to gather tiny sparkling stones. And, this, sorry, this is a story from uh, the Hopi tribes, and it explains how the constellations were originally created. So, long ago, the Creator called on Earth for all the animals to gather tiny sparkling stones to place in the sky for light. He told each creature to take as many of the sparkling rocks as they could carry and draw a picture of themselves in the sky. Most of the animals, however, were too small to carry enough stones to complete their pictures. So the creator gave Coyote a large bag of stones to help him complete the pictures of the smaller creatures. But Coyote, being a trickster, grew impatient helping them. And he took the stones and flung them far into the sky. This explains why some of the star figures are unfinished and why the stars don't all form clear patterns. It was only when there were no rocks left that Coyote realized he had forgotten to make his own picture and was now left out of the sky forever. Coyote howled in sorrow, and even today, a coyote will howl at the sky because his picture is not up there. So here are Navajo constellations. The word for people in the Navajo language is Dine, and the word for constellations is So Dine. So the word constellations translates to star people. So I want to look at, first off, Let's look at this guy coming to the center. His name is Revolving Male. Oops. So let's pause him right there. So Revolving Male, he is where we know Ursa Major, the Big Dipper. That's the constellation that we identify with him. So if I take away the picture for a second, you can see uh, the Big Dipper right there. So this constellation, Revolving Male, he's a figure of a man laying down on his side, and he represents the father, and he is the protector of the home. And he is usually posed with Revolving Female, who's over on the side in the north. So Revolving Female is the mother. So she is uh, where Cassiopeia, our constellation Cassiopeia, which is like the W or the M, Revolving female is a figure of a woman lying on her side. She represents the mother of the home. And then we have Northern Fire. Find Northern Fire. And Lizard is just a sacred animal to the Navajo. Try to find Northern Fire for you guys. probably below us. The constellations, our planet is always revolving, so sometimes the constellations are below us. So we can talk about first big one over here. So first big one, he is a constellation that contains the star Antares, um, and this is in the Greek constellation Scorpius. So Antares is significant because it is a star that is a thousand times bigger than our sun. So it's a gigantic star. The first big one represents the elders, and he's often depicted holding a cane in his hand. He personifies the concept that with old age comes happiness and contentment. And next to him is the constellation Rabbit Tracks, which is also part of the tale of Scorpius. This constellation governs all hunting. He was used by hunters, Rabbit Tracks. It determines when a traditional hunting season began. So when this constellation remained in one place, the deer were not hunted because their young still depended on their mothers for nourishment. And during the spring and early summer, when the open end of the tracks pointed upward, no one can hunt game animals. Let's take the picture away. So you can see that it's currently pointing upward. I take the word away too. Yeah, so you can see rabbit tracks is currently pointing upward. So that means that no one may hunt game animals. But in the late fall, when the constellation would revolve, the open end would point downwards towards the earth, and that meant that the hunting season could begin. 
laws governing hunting were very, very strict because the Navajo were very dependent on animals for their food. Let's keep it moving. We'll look at man with feet apart next. man with feet apart, also known as squatting man. He is the leader and three other constellations fought, oops, I don't know, I'm trying to do it one handed, sorry guys. Three other constellations follow man with feet apart across the sky. And these are the first big one, first slender one, and the delay he. The man with feet apart represents adulthood, old age, and wisdom, and he is the leader that presides over meetings. So next, let's look at first slim one. So first slim one. He is uh, corresponding to our constellation Orion. First slim one is associated with agriculture and he's known as the keeper of months. The curved line of stars beside first slim one represents a digging stick. It's used as a tool used by many to prepare the ground for planting seeds. And the reason he's called Slim is related to the fact that First Slim One is visible during the night and during the lean winter months of the year, when most plants are dormant and the food for people is hard to find. Next to him is the Delehi. Delehi is our uh, constellation Pleiades. Or this figure is synonymous with the Pleiades or the Seven Sisters. And it is said that when the holy people were coming to this world by a rainbow, the Dilyehi were the children that were too busy playing and got left outside in the sky. These children represent youth. When this constellation appears over the morning horizon, it indicates that it's time to plant. So they are often called the planting stars. And then let's try one more time to find our last constellation, Northern Fire. Uh, let's see, like I said, lizard is just a very holy animal. All right, I don't know if it's going to come up for us. That's okay. Okay, right, I'm going to reset and let's go look at another tribe. So the next one, we are going to look at this, is the Lakota constellation. So let's look at how the Lakota tribe saw the sky. You can see they have a lot of constellations. So up at the top, we have Fireplace. So Fireplace is uh, just a central common area of the home. It's the constellations we know as Leo and Gemini. So that's Fireplace. And then we have Blue Birth Woman. So we can see Blue Birth Woman looks pretty familiar. It looks like the Big Dipper. And this constellation is uh, Ursa Major, the Big Dipper, and it's a constellation that is composed of seven stars of Blue Birth Woman, which correspond to the seven stages of a woman's maturation and lives at the center. So this is the seven Lakota council fires as well. So Blue Birth Woman assists midwives in their births, and she lives at the very center of the Big Dipper. The Dipper is said to carry water to women giving birth, and it also serves as a boat to ferry the spirits of deceased people across the Milky Way. So I wanted to mention too that the Lakota were nomadic and they didn't always camp in the same spots. So therefore, they were very dependent on the four cardinal directions and observing the sun's journey across the sky. So some museums, they display the painted hides of the Lakota as star maps, which resemble elaborate compass roses used by sailors. 
So these portable maps would be handy for making solar shadow time measurements by using a stick with an arrowhead that was placed in an upright center on the pattern. So the Lakota come from the plains, the high plains, the Black Hills, the Dakotas, and Wyoming area of the United States. So let's look at our next constellation. We'll move the sky a little bit. You'll see salamander. Salamander was a secret animal. There's also turtle. And elk behind it. And so you'll see these animals. There's four of them total. Elk, turtle, salamander, and snake. These were all sacred animals to the Lakota. You'll see dried red willow next to elk. elk. Dried red willow was uh, it's within around the outskirts of the sacred hoop, and it was a very important herb that was put in the sacred pipe to be smoked. Shamans would use a wooden spoon to carry live coals, which represented the sun, and in the sky, Ursa Minor carries the live coals to the celestial pipe, which is this constellation. So during the spring equinox, the Lakota would conduct a pipe ceremony to welcome back the thunders. So we can talk about the sacred hoop next, which is this big red ring. The sacred hoop is uh, it's the area in the United States known as the Black Hills, and this was thought to exist within the sacred hoop. This was the Earth Mother's ceremonial home, and it mirrors the circle of stars in the sky. So as the sun moves counterclockwise through the constellations, the Lakota would move clockwise through the Black Hills, moving from one ceremonial site to another. Each real-world site is correlated to a constellation and a star, and the ceremonies mirror the sun's path on the plains, which is pretty cool. So inside of the sacred hoop, you'll see the Bears Lodge is the blue one. It was a sacred site in the Black Hills, Wyoming, known as the Devil's Tower, which is the national monument. Vision quests and sun dances were held here, and it was a big Lakota campsite during the winter. You'll also see, this one's kind of hard to see. Let me take the picture away just for a second so you can read the words a little easier. So you'll see buffalo embryo, and then we have hands within the sacred hoop, and then seven girls. So buffalo embryo is next. It's kind of that yellow area. So buffalo embryo, the Lakota believed that the buffalo was the embodiment of solar power. This was because the buffalo's migratory patterns around the Black Hills, which the Lakota followed, coincided with the sacred sites of the Lakota sun ceremonies. Since the buffalo was sacred, eating buffalo meat was considered to be eating energy from the sun. The seven girls over on the right, the Pleiades, again, the seven sisters, we can see her. So legend tells of seven little girls who were chased by a bear in the woods. They tried to escape by climbing a low rock. They begged the rock to help them and it transformed, growing higher and higher until the girls were pushed safely into the sky. The seven girls became stars and while the grooves on the devil's tower are the marks left by the bear's claws as he tried to climb up the rock to reach them. And then we have hand. So hand is inside of the yellow part next to buffalo embryo. So we can see hand right there, the lines of the constellation. So hand is the bottom half of what we know as Orion. It's Orion's belt makes up the hand's wrist. This constellation represents the arm of a Lakota chief. Through, though he was a great man, the chief was caught being selfish, and the gods sent the Thunderbird to punish him by ripping off his arm and throwing it up into the sky. The chief's daughter offered to marry anyone who could recover her father's arm. A young warrior named Fallen Star went on a quest to find the arm. His father was a star and his mother was a human, so he was able to travel in both realms. Fallen Star returned the chief's arm and married his daughter. The return of the arm to the chief symbolized harmony between the gods and the humans with the help of the younger generation. The last one I want to show you guys is Thunderbird. So let me move him up to the center for you. Might be stuck in that corner. There he goes. So the last one we have is Thunderbird. And Thunderbird is a giant bird that carries all of the clouds on his tail and the rain under his wings. 
When he flaps his wings, they make the sound of thunder, and lightning shoots out of his eyes. When the Thunderbird constellation is shining brightly in the sky, this means that the spring rainy season has arrived. That's pretty cool. So the last set of constellations I want to show you before we end are the Ojibwe constellations. So let's take away those pictures. I think these are the prettiest ones. So we have our Ojibwe constellations. Uh, the four main Ojibwe constellations are linked to the four seasons. So Hero Teacher, Nanny Buju, is the summer. Moose is the fall. Winter Maker is the winter. And Curly Tail, the Great Panther, is the spring. So here's a story that explains the eternal battle in the stars between Nanny Buju, our Hero Teacher, and evil Curly Tail, the Great Panther. Long ago, when the world was new, Nanny Buju was the protector of the Ojibwe people. The enormous Curly Tail would hunt and attack his people, and so Nanny Buju challenged Curly Tail to a battle. During their fight, Nanny Buju shot a magical arrow into Curly Tail's side. Curly Tail ran away back to his cave, taking to his bed. Curly Tail offered all the riches in the world to whoever could cure him. A great line of creatures went to his bedside, trying to cure him for the wealth. No one succeeded, for the arrow's magic was too powerful. Nanny Buju, wearing a frog skin as a disguise, went into the cave and stood beside Curly Tail's bed. As the evil Curly Tail writhed in pain, Nanny Buju rammed the arrow even deeper into his chest. Curly Tail screamed and began to cry. His giant tears flowed so fiercely that he flooded the earth. Nanny Buju, realizing his mistake, pulled the arrow out of Curly Tail and banished him to live underwater forever. Then Nanny Buju began to create dry land for his people to live on once again. So you guys will see we have another flood myth, so pretty cool. So I am going to, since Moose is up here, let's talk about him. So Moose, this is the constellation we know as Pegasus. Moose is uh, representing the fall to the Ojibwe, and Moose provides food, clothing, and shelter for the Ojibwe people, much like deer or caribou. Next to him we have Crane. Crane is the constellation we know as Cygnus the Swan. Crane is one of the leaders of the clan system, and he and Crane encourages her people to stay strong. We have Hole in the Sky. So up here, Hole in the Sky is thought to be a cluster of stars. So the Pleiades, the Seven Sisters. The Ojibwe believes it to be a cluster of stars that looks like a hole in the sky. This is a window that the great beings in the sky used to use to look down upon the earth. So let's take away the picture, and you can see the hole in the sky really looks like a hole in the sky, so pretty cool. Alright, so let's move the sky a little bit, see the other ones? So coming up we have Winter Maker. Winter Maker's constellation represents the winter season. His constellation is where we know Orion or Taurus, and this constellation represents winter, and Winter Maker is a very important mythological figure. He's a strong Ojibwe canoe man, and his outstretched arms rule the winter sky. Let's look for Ojibwa or uh, Nanny Buju. Next. There he is. So this is the Ojibwe hero teacher, also known as Nanny Buju. So this constellation represents summertime. It's where our Scorpius is. And this was a hero figure that had many adventures on Earth. He had human-like characteristics, such as making mistakes, which he always learned from, and his constellation is shown shooting an arrow at Curly Tail. In his constellation, uh, many of the hero teacher's stories are traditionally told only when there is snow on the ground. So that's pretty cool. We're going to rewind the sky a little bit and I'll show you Curly Tail. Great Panther. 
curly tail is a constellation that rises in the winter and is overhead in the spring. Because the enormous spirit cat lives at the bottom of lakes, he can cause flooding or water danger. Anytime a person would drown, it was because of curly tail. That is why curly tail's position overhead was always a warning of the spring floods and a sign for people to move to higher ground. People also knew when the great cat was overhead, the lakes would not be frozen, so they would be dangerous to cross. So this is where our constellations, Leo and Cancer, are. All right, what do we have that's left? Sweat Lodge, an exhausted feather. We haven't seen them yet. Move the sky a little bit. We have... There's Sweat Lodge and Exhausted Feather. So these two constellations, um, the Sweat Lodge represents a purification ceremony, and it is a returning to the womb, a remembering or renewing of our spirit. The Exhausted Bather is a person who is exhausted after participating in the Sweat Lodge. He is exhausted on the outside, but full of life and strong on the inside. Next to him, we have the Loon. The loon is where we know as Ursa Minor, Ursa Minor or the Little Dipper. So if I take the pictures away, you can see the Little Dipper right there on the loon um, and the North Star. So this was a very, the loon was a very important messenger. Loon and Crane are both teachers in their, and leaders in their clan systems and they work together. The loon prefers to stay in the water, but it must go on land to make a nest. Therefore, loon stands at the doorway between the land and the water, the material world and the spirit world. And the last one that we have up here is the great fisher. So let me move the sky a little bit so we can see fisher a little bit better. So we have great fisher. So fisher is a weasel. And he is, great fisher is our Ursa Major Big Dipper constellation. So you can see, oops. You can see the Big Dipper in them right there. Take away the word. So Fisher is a hero and the best friend of Nanny Buju or the hero teacher. He has magical powers as been distinguished by his bravery against large and dangerous monsters. Sometimes Fisher is portrayed as a man, other times a weasel, and he was a very sacred animal to the Ojibwe. The Fisher is the only animal that can kill and eat porcupines. It is neither diurnal or nocturnal, but prefers to always be on the move, sleeping and eating like it when it feels like it. It does not build a home in one place, but rather makes homes in all different places. So I have one last story for you, and this one is about the great fisher. As winter was ending and spring was beginning, all of the little birds began to come out and sing their songs. This angered the ogres who were still hibernating, so they began to capture all the birds of spring tied them up in bundles and held them prisoner in their cave. Spring never came, as the birds of spring were captured and winter continued. Everyone knew that the ogres had captured the birds, but those who tried to save them never came back. The great fisher, the hero who was known for his courage and his wit, decided that he would free the birds and bring back spring. In his human form, he traveled a long way to the cave and snuck inside. He found one ogre asleep, surrounded by the bundles of captured birds. Great Fisher leapt on the sleeping ogre. He shoved black pitch in his mouth so he did not cry out, and he tied him up. The Great Fisher then tried to break the ropes that bound the birds, but they were bound too tight. So he transformed himself into the Fisher Weasel, and using his sharp teeth, he began to chew through the ropes. After he had freed several bundles of birds, the ogre finally managed to break the pitch from his mouth and shout to his brothers, Fisher breaks the bundles. The birds of spring are escaping. Fisher heard the other ogres rushing towards him from deeper in the cave. He leapt up, transforming into a human once again. He gathered all the bird bundles he had not yet opened and put them in a pack on his back and raced out of the cave. Great Fisher ran very fast, but hearing the heavy bundles of birds slowed him down. He looked behind him and saw that several of the pursuing ogres had bows and arrows and were about to start shooting at him. Great Fisher went into the woods and lost the ogres. He began to climb the highest tree he could find. He reached the top and transformed into the fisher weasel to chew through the bundles. By the time he had freed the birds, the ogres had found him. They began to climb the tree to get to him, so he leapt down to the ground and ran towards the river. 
the ogres pursued him, shooting arrows at him. He was hit once in the tail before he leapt into the river and swam away to safety. He survived his adventure, freeing all the birds of spring, but his tail was broken from the arrow. And this is why the Big Dipper has a bent tail. So you can see the arrow is still stuck in it. So before we end the night, oops, I will take the spines away. Before we end the night, I want to tell one last short story that comes from the Oto tribe of Oklahoma. In this story, it tells of a sleep man whose name is Katuye. The sleep man's job was to wash over children at night so their dreams would be happy. When Patuye saw the first light of dawn peeking up over the horizon, he knew it was time to leave. But before he did, he left each child with a blessing. May the great spirit bring sunrise to your hearts. So kind of keep this in mind as we move forward with our quarantine. Remember that you need to bring sunrise and sunshine to other people's hearts and their lives. So we hope that you guys enjoyed the show. If you have any questions about any of the stories, please comment on our Facebook page and we will get back to you as soon as we can. So take care, stay safe, and stay healthy.